So one of the questions that um, we're often asked, and it's I think it's a really good place to really start, is with, you know, what is what is actually dementia? So I thought one thing that might be useful is to just kind of explain that very briefly. Um, so just let me know if you are able to see this slide. Yes. Great. So um, dementia is really a, uh, it's, it's a term that's used to describe a group of sin symptoms that are associated with cognitive decline. It's a syndrome. So it's really, it's, it's a group of um, symptoms that occur together. And what, what really, what, what really we see is that there's an impact on things that allow, help us to think, um, decision, make, plan, and things that we use to do our daily tasks. So those are the things that actually get impacted in dementia. And what, what does all of this include? So what we often see is changes in memory. You know, people begin to forget more often. Um, people um, have challenges in terms of learning new information. Um, even something in the later stages of dementia, even something like following a conversation, for example, or following something on a, um, a, a television serial that they may have been watching for many years becomes very difficult for them. And that might be due to um, difficulty with comprehension. Um, they, we see that there are changes in language. Um, people sometimes struggle to find words. They may say things with different, what we call word substitutions. Um, and overall, it might become very difficult for that person, to, for, you know, for others around that person to really understand what they're saying. But in addition to that, sometimes we also see that the expressive language abilities or the person's, uh, you know, entire expression reduces. So these are all the different kinds of symptoms that we um, see in dementia. Um, there may be impairments in um, orientation or judgment. And by orientation impairments, I mean they may have difficulty with trying to understand whether it is, for example, daytime or nighttime, um, where they are. Um, in terms of judgment, we often see that social judgment is impacted. So you, you see odd behaviors, things that are very unlike that person. Um, and all of these symptoms can become very disturbing uh, for family members. They can be very embarrassing for family members. And that's the reason why um, there's also a lot of stigma associated with dementia. And one of the things that we're interested in doing is really tackling that as well. Um, another question that we're often asked is, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? So I'll just quickly address that because dementia is a broad umbrella term that's used to describe these groups of symptoms, as I mentioned. And Alzheimer's is one of the most common types of dementia with a particular um, pathology that we see. In fact, um, almost between 50 to 75 percent of dementias are due to Alzheimer's uh, disease. Another, the, the, the next most um, prevalent type of dementia is vascular dementia, which has underlying causes with, you know, it's related with things like stroke. Um, and then Lewy body dementia, which is uh, where when you look at the pathology, there's a, a, a particular, um, you know, the pathological um, underpinning of this is, is Lewy bodies. And then the frontotemporal dementias, which uh, result in usually a lot of behavioral changes, and that's about 10 to 15 percent of um, uh, dementias. So these are all basically different types of dementias. There are others. But what's important to remember is that Dementia is a wide term, and it's really used to describe the set of symptoms. And the, the set of symptoms that an individual has, um, it's, it could be very different from another person with dementia. And also that um, the, the illness per se is quite complex. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish between the different types of dementias as well and, until you look at it um, you know, with other uh, things like uh, scans or pathologies and think you know reports and things like that. So uh, it's 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 basically a very broad kind of um, term that's used to describe these uh, range of symptoms that are associated with cognitive decline. And this is uh, these symptoms 
tend to be progressive and they tend to, um, the, the rate of progression can defer. It in fact can range from, you know, following initial diagnosis, it can range from anywhere between five um, years to up to 15, often 20 years, average about eight to 10 uh, years. So um, it's, it's a very, very um, diverse, a kind of complex condition. And I think the key thing to remember is that no two people with dementia are exactly the same. So, so that's just really, really important to remember. So I'm just going to stop there and um, maybe we can take any other questions, Arjuna. Sure, sure. So I think uh, one of the, one of the basic questions which people ask is what is the difference between uh, normal aging and and dementia right so my question is that I open the fridge and then I sit there and see what I came to do in the fridge mm -hmm. so is that an indication of something coming or is it something else so I think if you can uh, explain a little bit about how what is the difference between normal and aging and and dementia sure again and this is something which is very confusing because when you look at those set of symptoms that I just described um, things like forgetfulness or confusion um, you know these are things that are actually quite um, common I think all of us have maybe experienced being forgetful at times feeling confused at times so it is quite difficult to differentiate particularly in the initial stages um, for family members whether this is actually a, a part of natural aging or whether these are early signs or symptoms of dementia so again what i'd like to do is just quickly um, share a slide um, and this might actually so i this this has some, this table, I like to use this table to basically describe some of the differences between natural aging processes and what are possibly signs of dementia. Um, so one thing that I think we're all familiar with, and we would have had at least one experience like this, is really forgetting names of people. And Forgetting names of people whom you don't see on a regular place on a regular basis, that's that's actually a uh, that's fairly normal. But in dementia, what happens is that the person begins to forget the names of people who are close to them. So forgetting the names of close relatives, forgetting the names of friends, um, forgetting the names of people whom they frequently interact with. So that's a warning sign. Uh, another thing that people often ask is um, they get lost. Like when, you, when you're traveling somewhere and you sudden, suddenly get lost, is that a sign of confusion? Is that, I mean, should I be worried about this because this has never happened to me before? Well, sometimes when you're preoccupied with something else, you may just momentarily forget directions or forget about where you're, you're going. So long as you're able to remember that, that's okay. But in dementia, a person tends to um, get lost even in familiar places. So they may have been going to, for example, a marketplace to buy groceries um, for several years. And then on their way back home, they forget the route and then they get lost. And then that becomes very concerning. So that's another uh, warning sign. Now, um, naturally, as we um, age, um, it, you know, fatigue is, 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 is a part of uh, the natural aging, aging process. And it's absolutely fine if you are just tired and you don't want to tidy up for some time, or you just say, let, let things be the way they are for a while. That's absolutely okay. But a differentiating sign in dementia is when someone becomes very disorganized. They're actually having difficulty taking decisions about how to organize their things. And along with that, they become very indifferent about this. It's almost as though they don't realize how, um, you know, that the way that they're now, that the disorganized way of living is a problem. And this gets picked up very often by family members because this was very different from how the person used to be previously. 
Um, another thing which I just wanted to briefly touch upon is um, you know, changes in interests. I mean, it's very natural for anybody to have changes in their interests across time. And that's OK. Sometimes, um, you know, family members often say that the, my older family member is no longer interested in um, doing something that they used to do before. Um, sometimes that's okay and, and you should encourage them and we talk a bit more about this later to try different things, try newer things. Um, in dementia, what we see is that the person has a lot of difficulty with making choices about the kind of things that they need to do. So it's um, so that's where the challenge begins to develop. And so there are different kinds of um, things that we see which are early warning signs of dementia. And it's important to understand what these are so that we know the difference between things that are okay and it's just a natural part of aging and being able to identify those things which are actually early warning signs and de definitely mean that you should seek uh, a professional um, help or an evaluation for, um, you know, to understand what's actually going on. So I'm just gonna stop there. And um, Arjun, I think maybe we can take it from there. Sure, sure. So, uh, uh, Tashri, uh, coming to the risk factors, you know, I think there are a lot of questions and especially, you know, in the age group of 40 to 50, 60, where people have either parents who are getting diagnosed or have some relative or friend, you know. So, uh, what are the risk factors? A lot of questions around how how can I save myself from getting this illness? And um, we are looking for your wisdom in this area <laughs> as to how how what are the steps we can take? Yeah, and I think that that's really, really important because um, th there've actually been a, a lot of research on the risk factors for dementia and we're actually getting to understand this a lot better now. And again, I'll just I'll just kind of share a quick slide which will help everyone um, understand this better. But um, a lot of research has really looked at what are the different things that we can do to prevent the risk factors for dementia um, across the lifespan. And I think that's really important to remember because it's never too early and it's never too late. So um, I hope you can see this slide. This is actually um, a, it, it's it's from a very, um, you know, a, a study that was very um, important in our understanding of dementia and this 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 research really helped us understand um, how there are certain risk factors that we can actually modify. So we call these as modifiable risk factors because there are things that we can do to change um, them. And these this could be, as I was mentioning, at different stages of our life. And what this di I'll, I'll just kind of walk you through this diagram because I think it's really a uh, useful and helpful way to understand what we can do differently to protect ourselves um, you know, from the risks of de developing dementia. Um, so firstly, what th there has been uh, an association between lower levels of education and a risk for dementia. And so therefore, getting an education or um, it, it is really important in early life. And that's why there has been a huge push also in general towards education, because this is very important. And what this means is that if the brain is not, the, the more stimulation that the brain gets through education um, is, is it, it creates what we call a, as, what we know as a cognitive reserve. So, even if a person um, is at risk for dementia, uh, if they're educated and their brain has been, un, you know, been stimulated through their life um, in various ways, and they have good cognitive reserve, and there are various other things that also um, for, go into this, such as, um, you know, being engaged in some sort of um, occupation or doing, you know, things on a, on a regular basis, even if you're a homemaker, um, that even if you have uh, you know, the risk for dementia, it's going to come later in your life. And it's, you, you, 
you're probably going to manifest those symptoms uh, more slowly. So that's the reason why education is really important in early uh, life. Um, and one of the things that's really important in midlife is, um, and there's actually, this, that's that blue circle that you can see in this slide. Um, interestingly, the largest risk factor of 8% is associated with hearing loss. And one of the things that we don't think about enough is, um, you know, we see a lot of resistance amongst the people whom we work with at Samvedna is, is, is about getting hearing, uh, the hearing checked and then, you know, using a hearing aid if required. And, and this can actually put you at greater risk for developing dementia. So it's very important to, um, you know, get your hearing checked in midlife so that you can mitigate that risk factor sooner. The other things, um, traumatic brain injuries, so head injury, stay, stay safe, um, avoid falls, um, very important. Um, hypertension, again, very common lifestyle related condition. You can, there's a lot that you can do to minimize, um, you know, the risks for hypertension as well as control it well. Um, you know, it's, and we'll talk about that a bit later, but then things like reducing alcohol consumption, um, and, you know, obesity, uh, these are all the things that are very important. And if you address these in midlife, it can delay your risk for developing uh, dementia. Um, towards later life, the risk factors that are most important to keep in mind um, are depression. Um, you know, it's important to address that if there's depression. Um, stop smoking. That That's, again, a surprising the high contributor, 5%. Um, social isolation, very common. Um, and something, again, that can be addressed with very, um, you know, with, with, with some very minimal inputs. Um, air pollution, diabetes, these, um, these are things which, you know, I think we need to work together as a community to um, deal with. And physical activity, again, you know, exercise, the importance of that really can't be overemphasized. So I'm just going to, this is, uh, I, I just thought this was would be helpful to understand in terms of the risk factors and the things that you can do to mitigate your risk for developing dementia. Uh, thank you, Jayashri, for sharing that. So, you know, you mentioned about depression and, um, and uh, in the, especially in the uh, late stage, and a link to dementia. Is that something which is also a risk factor if somebody is clinically diagnosed with depression, even in, you know, like his mid teens or, uh, you know, in, in midlife? Is that also a cause for concern? Uh, because then, you know, people, if they are cognizant of this, then they can uh, clinically seek help for it so that other risks can be mitigated. So is that... Yeah, absolutely. And um, that, that there's actually a very clear um, link between um, a risk for dementia and um, de a diagnosis of depression. And in fact, there's a very uh, interesting um, research study that was, I think it was carried out, um, I think it was a Danish uh, study um, mm -hmm. with, I think it, it, was, it was a large, very large cohort study um, across a different life, you know, across the yeah. lifespan. And one of the things that um, the results of this study showed that, it, you know, anyone with a diagnosis of depression, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, it's it's um, it was almost a double, uh, you know, the risk for developing dementia was almost double. It was greater if, if the if if it was the risk for developing dementia was greater in men with depression than women. Um, and interestingly, a lifetime diagnosis, like a diagnosis of depression at any time point in the life was actually related with a greater risk for dementia. So that just goes to show that, um, you know, staying happy, um, preventing, you know, addressing depression earlier on actually is, is so critical, even if you want, you know, to take care of your brain health later on uh, throughout the life course as well. Right. And I especially liked your uh, word modifiable risk factors. I think which is which is applicable to a lot of us sitting in this room, 
because obesity, alcohol intake, um, physical exercise, these are things uh, which we all can work on. And, you know, I, I, I hope, you know, um, we talked about cognitive reserve. So, jitna dimaag ko istamal karoge, utna aapka cognitive reserve badega. Uh, I had a small question related to that. You mentioned uh, that you know in early in early life there's a very lot of importance associated. We need to look at education, right? There are uh, there are still uh, you know in India there are still a lot of adults or older adults who are who are uh, who have not got that early education for whatever reasons because of their you know social factors or social economic factors. So how do you suggest that those people can also uh, address this risk factor, even if today they are not diagnosed with dementia? What are the suggestions? I think the, um, the important thing to remember is that this, this research was really also, you know, one of the things that we are actually interested in as researchers is to see keep, what is it that we need to do to thinking ahead? So that's why education in early life becomes important. But as you rightly said, I mean, a lot of people haven't had those opportunities. Um, people who are in their 70s or 80s for, um, you know, in education, things have changed a lot. Um, one of the most important things to remember is that the brain needs stimulation. Um, and it's very important, you know, if, if you try to learn something new, Mm -hmm. that's that in itself is protective um and if you don't if um you know sometimes we out of our reverence for older uh you know our parents or older adults we try to be very supportive and caring and we say ki aap ye mat ki hum kar lenge aapko khana banane ki zarurat nahi hai you know these but these are actually the very things that keep your brain ticking so, you know, if, if you, it's important to remember that an older adult may need more support to do those activities, for example, if they're a homemaker. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important as uh, the, the family members to continue to allow them to do certain things, because that's, that's the thing that's giving them that the brain that stimulation. So for example, if there's, uh, you know, a lot of your brain is being used in recollecting a recipe and cooking a meal. Right, right. There's a lot of fine motor coordination which comes with chopping vegetables, matar chilna, bahut choti choti cheezen ho sakti hai. Um, but they've, they're great stimulation exercises. So yeah. I think that's just really important to remember. Yes. And uh, while we are talking about stimulation, what is the role of uh, music, uh, you know, in this whole journey? Because I know there's a lot of literature out there and and I'm really thinking of it in the Indian context. And especially, you know, we are sitting here in Gurgaon and Delhi and all the big cities, but there is a whole rural population which is not, you know, privy to a lot of things which we have access to. So what, uh, you know, uh, what is the role of music in, in helping ward off or reduce the risk, I would say, not ward off, because you will correct me for that. <laughs> And I think I think that's really really uh, important because um, music is well. I think you know if I were to ask everyone, how do you feel when you listen to music? Majority of people would say it makes them feel good. Um, and I think feeling good, feeling happy is kind of again you see that being linked with um, you, you know not feeling so depressed. So keeping it, it's linked with your mood. Um, so that's that's one way where music has its role to play. And another thing is that, um, you know, a lot of people, I mean, you may enjoy singing, you may enjoy just singing bhajans, you may do some shloka part, something, whatever. There's, these are practices that are part of our daily routine or our cultural practices. And um, these are also, they, they provide stimulation uh, to the mind. So listening to music triggers certain circuits in the brain which have been shown to uplift mood and again stimulate the mind in a certain way that's protective so definitely i think um 
I think we already do a lot of things. We've been doing a lot of things that are protective through the life course. And the important thing to remember is to, that we need to continue to do those as we age and not stop. Um, because sometimes our, you know, the opportunities to do that reduces for various other reasons. For example, um, uh, you know, we see we see this with a lot of the people whom we work with. Pelev, um, her rose, her, you know, Shamko Mandir jate the, wahan pe baat ke kuch bhajan wagera gaate the saath mein ab mobility issues aagi hai. So you can't do that any longer. Now that's a loss of stimulation. How do you how do you help that person continue to do those activities even though they're unable to visit that Mandir? So that's just one example, and I think it goes also with with men. There are things that they can do, um, but the important thing is to remember. That the brain needs stimulation. Absolutely, absolutely. And you also spoke about the role of socialization, which I think uh, uh, what you shared about, you know, um, for example, hearing impairment. So hearing impairment itself and not willing to wear your hearing devices is uh, is isolating yourself, you know, and uh, which is a big challenge, I think. Uh, there's very, very, very high resistance to, uh, uh, you know, taking on any assistive devices in uh, older adults in India. Maybe it is a global phenomenon, but since we are exposed to the Indian context, but that's what I see. So, uh, no, thank you for sharing this, Jayashree. Uh, I think, uh, so, you know, we talked about the risk factors and, uh, you, you spoke about what is not dementia and what is dementia. What, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of questions about what are those early, early signs and, you know, symptoms which, which you should be watching out for, you know. Uh, whether, uh, there, there are a lot of questions on that. So maybe if there are some more uh, tips from you on this, that would really help one of the so I'm going to flip that a bit and say that we we've we've we we know that there's that people with dementia have difficulties with their memory we know that they tend to struggle with daily activities um and that becomes obvious to family members often when I mean sometimes you know the that becomes more obvious to family members at a point when it's very obvious. You know, when things have gone so wrong, when they're forgetting something that it's almost shocking for the family members. Yes. But there's a period before that. Yes. And sometimes this can be almost five, seven, 10 years before that when a person has started to struggle. Right. And I think for all of us, and myself included, I think you're included in this as well. We're all included in this. This is where awareness comes in. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that if we're beginning to face difficulties that we're concerned about, mm -hmm. um, and we're experiencing that sort of a shift ourselves, um, that that's a time to actually just to speak with someone. And, you know, it's good to get the reassurance that there's nothing, you know, amiss. But in case you are actually having, uh, in case your memory is, for example, uh, more impacted than as compared to no other adults of your age, then that's an early indicator. So, um, you know, we use neuropsychological tests, for example, to assess this. Mm -hmm. and, and in the neuropsychological test, we compare, um, you know, your, your cognitive abilities uh, in, with those of other adults. Uh, of a similar sociodemographic um, age background. So that's 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 a very, very crucial thing. So in terms of, I, I would say the early warning, those signs remain the same. If you're forgetting things, you're feeling more confused, having difficulty in planning, um, you find that you're struggling with words, um, you're getting confused. lost in familiar places, confused, then reach out and get an assessment done for yourself. And, and we have the map tool as well. And maybe I think you can talk to that as well. Right, right, right. Yeah, so uh, I think that we have put up in the chat also. So we have a we have a, a dementia screener test, which is basically um, um, a self-evaluation. You could do it for yourself or 
any parent or any loved one and just uh, see what the results show and then come and talk to us. You don't have to, uh, you know, uh, there is a complimentary session with that. So you can come and uh, book a consultation and speak to our counselors and understand your score. And then if there is a need for further psychological evaluation, then, you know, um, that can be done. Uh, so just to add to this, uh, Samvedna has been doing um, early detection and diagnosis. We have been promoting this and before the pandemic, we were doing a lot of this by going into physical communities and you know working with adults and it was very time consuming. So now this, uh, this tool actually is uh, very simple to use. It probably takes two to two and a half minutes to answer these questions and you will get your evaluation and then you can come and talk to us. So um, it's been built with a certain scientific background and, you know, we are still validating it, but it's a, it's a screener. So I would request all of you who are here today to do try it out and see uh, and uh, come and talk to us. Don't get alarmed by anything. Uh, first consultation is complimentary. Okay. So, uh, uh, so we'll move on to actually, you know, today's topic is about fostering dementia inclusive communities in India, right? And uh, the problem is you know, we tend to hide our illnesses. So uh, that is a standard line which we like to use. Now, uh, and it's very important, you know, I the way that I, uh, we look at the community is really Ki home mein kya karna chahiye? What is it that we need to make a dementia-friendly environment in the home? The second is about the family, friends, and the, and the support system which the person has. And third is the external support, which I'll talk about later. But maybe I'll request you to first talk about the home and then the family and immediate network as to how can we, uh, you know, what, what is it that can be done to make it more inclusive in that context? So I think that's really, really important. And one of the things that we, uh, we really advocate for is the importance of uh, a dementia inclusive society. And I just, so, so what do we really mean by dementia inclusive? Uh, society. And this is really a society where, um, you know, people with dementia and their carers are able to experience no stigma. And there, there's no discrimination, they're able to fully participate in the things that they would have always been doing. Um, they, they feel respected, um, their dignity is maintained. Um, and they have, um, they're, they're allowed to be, you know, continue living independently and experience a good quality of life. So that's, that's what we basically mean by a, uh, a dementia inclusive society. And as, as you said, this, you know, this starts at home. So if we were to look at all of these different components and think about how, you know, if we have a parent or a relative who has dementia, what we need to start thinking, ki, how can we start to interact with them so that we are being more inclusive? What we usually see is that when the, that we we tell the person we, we, we say they're no longer capable of doing something. Um, and whilst they we know that there is a deterioration and their abilities to do uh, things change over time, if we start to look at the person with dementia as being incapable, then that's not being very inclusive. So what we need to do is foster an environment where we are respectful. We need to um, we need to see how we can do things that can encourage them to still participate in the things, the daily things that we were um, that we've been doing as a family. So, for example, if an individual is no longer able to go and buy the groceries independently. Can they at least sit and help with putting some of them away or something? You know, it's, it could be something in a very different way. How, how can we how can we involve them and keep them involved in simple day-to-day -day activities? Um, that's that's 
that's like a that's that's one starting point. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that uh, I I want to say just like to add to that ki don't correct them, don't question. Mm -hmm. Achha, batao. Test test shuru ho jata hai. Ah, exactly. Oh. Aap, e, 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 the way we communicate is so important. Right. You know, sometimes what, what happens is once, um, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like labels. Once we say that this person has dementia, it's meant, it's meant to, uh, it, you know, the family members get scared, but information is power. So once you once you're aware of a diagnosis, this actually helps you to plan what you need to do better. So rather than constantly being on edge as a family member and questioning the person, that's that's very discomforting for the for the individual who is struggling with their memory. Get involved. A better approach is to say, you know, remember when we used to do this together. And previously in that we, it might have been 100% them and 0% you or 10% you and you would come in towards the end. And slowly that may shift and it may be 80% you and 20% of them, but keep them involved in that. So it's, I think that's very important to remember in any activity. Right, right, right. And uh, what is your advice for the extended family? You know, because uh, one is extended family and the network, for, for example, a neighborhood or if somebody is still in a work life, right? Mm -hmm. it, we have come across a lot of people who were still working and they were diagnosed with this illness. So what what kind of uh, awareness can be built in that, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem? Uh, what would you ideally like to do? <laughs> so so the, the WHO has actually come up with a toolkit for um, dementia inclusive societies. And I think that that's, that's a starting point for all of us to get involved in it. It beautifully lays out the different elements and ways in which we need to start doing things. Um, we've actually, and this came out, I think it was 2021, um, but even before that at some way that we were working with the society and trying to see how at, at a very micro level, how we can make some of these changes. For example, I, I think um, we, we had one uh, a wonderful person with whom we were working and they would, want to go down to the shop every day and buy something. And this was, this was the family members found this very difficult and challenging. So um, we, we spoke with the shopkeeper and we told them, we sensitized them that this person has dementia and this is, this is part of the symptom. They don't remember that they have just come here and bought this. So uh, we worked with the shopkeeper and we, we, we helped them understand that if this person comes and asks for this, you know, give it to them, we'll come back and, uh, you know, replace it or whatever. But we actually worked with the community to, uh, so, and this was an, this is just one example of inclusivity because the person with dementia is being allowed to do something that gives them pleasure and, and comfort. Um, and the the shopkeepers also sensitized and, and they're, they're doing their bit uh, in the community as well. Um, and I think, when we talk of sensitization is really important, we all have a role to play. So whether it be from, uh, you know, sensitization in schools, sensitization in the workplace, um, to sensitization in, in communities and societies, banks, um, yes. you know, airports, places like this, it's, it's absolutely critical that we are more sensitive and aware that if we see somebody who's behaving a certain way that we should not be judgmental, look at them and embarrass the, the family members or that individual. Uh, we should be as aware enough to understand that this is an illness and um, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a very, a very important point. You spoke about, you know, sensitizing the, the communities and the support services. Uh, you mentioned banks. I, I think uh, senior citizens are the primary customers who are going to the banks. And uh, if you walk into any any bank, private or government, the people there are, the staff is typically very hassled and they don't know how to deal with that, that level of communication. And then if 
you have somebody who is in early stages or mild cognitive impairment, then you know it becomes even more challenging. So uh, that is one area. Airports, I I feel that a lot of things which are which are probably MCI and get covered in some other form. And uh, a huge opportunity there for uh, you know educating family uh, employees in these sectors, in banks and in uh, you know airports or travel industry about how to deal with people with dementia and you know support support the family and the community at large. Um, in terms of uh, the the uh, other uh, areas, I think you had a very good slide. Uh, you want to put that up, uh, which was about the inclusivity for uh, dementia inclusive societies. So oh, I can just share the slide and show you what. So this is basically a um, this is a, a, a screenshot from the WHO toolkit, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, so, so this is this is freely available online, and you can look at this. But it's basically talking about how we need to, um, you know, how we need to work with different groups of um, in in the community, general volunteers, school children, religious leaders, um, you know, the the bureaucrats, um, hospital staff, pharmacists. You know, I think they are such a uh, they're, they're such a critical key point because yeah. they interact with the elderly who go there for medication for other things. They they absolutely need to be sensitized about dementia. Bank employees, shop owners, like we spoke about, um, you know. So, and and uh, even bus drivers, you know, taxi transport. Uh, you, you know, we want the aim of a dementia inclusive society on an ideal world. What this means is that a person living with dementia can continue to live in the environment that they've been comfortable in um, for as long as they're able to be mobile and um, you know, engage. So, so that's really the, uh, the aim of creating a dementia inclusive uh, society. And there are several ways that we, and I think we, we, that we can do this and we all have a role to play. So, I mean, if you were to just look at that diagram and think about where do I fit in this, um, you will fit somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. No, uh, very uh, well explained. Um, and uh, I, I would now like to, you know, thank you for sharing this, Jayashree. I would like to now move on to a lot of questions which our, uh, you know, users are typing in as, uh, sorry, our audience are typing in, as well as uh, some which we have uh, received earlier also. So, uh, Jayashree, before we answer those questions, I think if you can just update us on the treatments available and there are questions on is there a cure for dementia would you like to just clarify that that's very important and then we can take the chat questions sure so um very briefly um unfortunately despite several decades of research there is no cure for dementia um there are drugs and medications that are being uh, trialed. And we hope that in the near future, there may be um, a you know medication that will offer a cure for dementia, but currently that does not exist. Um, the role of medication in dementia is really to, um, you know, to slow the progression and to also manage the other associated symptoms. So, so sometimes people with dementia may have you know, psychiatric symptoms, they, there may be hallucinations or delusions, they may have, and, and they may need antipsychotic medication. Um, there may be, um, you know, other kind of uh, related physical issues mm -hmm. for which they need medication. So, so medication management is a very critical part of dementia care management, but there is no cure for dementia per se. Um, interventions, um, however, are important to keep in mind. This, you know, just because we say there's no cure doesn't mean there's nothing that you can do about it. What we need to do is remember that dementia impacts the brain and that the brain has this property called neuroplasticity, which means that even if there's a part of the brain that's damaged, um, the, the brain has this amazing property where it just tries to, you know, figure out if there's another part that's still working that can take over this. And the way that it does 
what kind of fuels that is stimulation. So cognitive stimulation therapy, sensory stimulation therapies, um, you know, continued socialization, uh, all of these are things that are very, very important interventions. And then of course, you know, exercise will keep a person physically fit, uh, you know, a healthy diet will keep them physically fit. So those are, you know, it's this really the suite of things that you need to do, uh, which are very important as interventions. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that I hope that answers Mira and our Baker's question. Uh, definitely these stimulation therapies can help slow the progression of the illness. They can't stop it, but you know, I think it's a lot about uh life is quality kaise achi reh sakti hai. Or hum um uh individual ko we are not isolating the person, we are still giving them uh, whatever best and try to keep them as functional as possible. I think that is that is the aim of these therapies as well, and if my understanding is correct. And uh, we have been doing these therapies, uh, you know, we have had some very good successful case studies, and we have been doing these therapies in person uh, with people in a group setting. And now, you know, we also have a lot of online clients where we are who are coming to us in early stages where we are able to deliver these therapies online. And uh, just wanted to share that, just as a, that, you know, a lot of questions are asked about it, but this is not, today's session is not about cognitive stimulation therapies, but yeah, definitely they help. Uh, yes, you will get a recording of this session. Uh, all of us, uh, we, we will be emailing this to you. Uh, there is a question by Minakshi Pandey, and she talks about, Refer your slide on dementia risk. What about good eight hour sleep with at least 30 minutes in deep sleep to mitigate dementia? Um, sleep is a risk factor, Jeshri. <clears throat> healthy, healthy uh, good night's sleep. Well, I, would, I would say it's a protective factor. You need a good night's sleep. Sleep has a huge, it plays a role in as a restorative okay. f um in a restorative capacity. That's 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 why sleep oh. is so critical. Um and a lot of older adults um you know struggle with sleep for various reasons so good sleep hygiene is very very important to maintain uh through your uh, you know through from midlife to uh later life uh so so yes um good sleep is really important right right so there's also questions about diet diet and its role in prevention um would you like to talk a little bit about that so I think there's a couple of um, questions regarding specific foods like coconut oil, walnuts, and um, yeah, I think there's a couple of, um, there's some questions around that. So uh, definitely, so, so in a nutshell, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Uh, so we know that certain you know, eating a healthy diet is going to be good for our heart. It's also going to be good for your brain. So you need to include a balanced diet. It should have all the different food groups. Um, you, you, you need to, you need to have an adequate intake of even fluids and, and uh, water as well. Um, so definitely nutrition has a huge protective role and it's very important to maintain a good diet throughout the, the life course um, because that's going to be good for your uh, brain so omega-3 fatty acids and all which are you know very high in these nuts and all are, are important it's good to have this uh in a in you know a daily recommended portion of this is is absolutely advisable right right uh then there are some questions on excel on patch i don't know if you want to take that up or, or if you want to comment on that but there are uh any anything you would like to uh, add about Exelon patch and its effectiveness, or you would try to defer that to a neurologist. Um, I, I'm afraid I can't, I can't see the question in here, but I I think if it's um it, it definitely it's a it's uh one of the interventions, one of the medical interventions, and um in in case this is something which has been recommended by your uh, neurologist. <coughs> Uh, it's it's something that you should definitely consider. I'm afraid I can't see that question. Uh, it's a question by Nilanjana, so you can just, just scroll to the chat and see. 
I, I think I see a question in here around um th there's there's one question about um the the role of you know is Indian classical music does it have any advantage over Western uh, music and better dementia management. And there's actually some interesting research studies which are, uh, you know, coming out on this. And there's, there's one which has looked at, for example, I think Carnatic music. Um, so uh, Carnatic music, jazz, and we, we're still trying to understand this in terms of what it's doing. But there are studies which, I mean, I, you know, which show that there is a change in brain function with music. Uh, improved brain function. So in, in general, I think that's that goes for music. Specifics of what type of music, I think there is some very interesting research out there. Maybe we can kind of look at that uh, in another uh, webinar separately at another time. Um, there's I think a very, there's, uh, there's a yeah. question by Bhavna on what are the physiological symptoms of dementia? And I think there was another question uh, related to that. Uh, somebody had asked about how can you reduce the plaque in the brain? So uh, you want to talk a little bit about the atrophy and what happens uh, in the brain? So, so basically in Alzheimer's disease, what happens is that there are, um, so, so there are protein deposits that kind of build up um, and, and these are known as amyloid uh, packs and tangles. And the, I, I think you were asking about what, what you know, what, how can these be removed? So, so one of the things that intervention dr drug trials are actually ongoing to see how these plaques can actually be removed from the brain. These basically what happens is these clumps of these these protein deposits and block the pathways um, and the and the connections across the brain, and that then results in the different kind of um, you know uh, deficits that we see in dementia. So the drug trials are trying to understand how we can remove these. Um, plaques. Um, and there's been some, you know, they've been kind of like mixed results. Some of them have been, uh, you know, shown that they have been able to remove these plaques. However, these, the current medications and all that are available, um, they, you know, often in the form of infusions, they're either very expensive, not yet widely available. Um, they're more research stage, um, uh, you know, interventions. Um, and there are some uh, complicated side effects such as microbleeds in the brain. Um, so it, it's it's good to be kind of aware about those uh, side effects as well right now. And as I've been mentioning, this is, it's still very much research stage, um, you know, medical interventions. And uh, we, we don't have a cure yet for this. Right, right. Thank you for sharing this, uh, Jayashree. So we still have a couple of minutes if there are any other questions by anybody uh, would like to answer. I think, I think there's a, um, an interesting question about overstimulation, uh, yeah. cognitive, physical, resulting from overwork. Can this be counterproductive? Um, and there's some there's some very interesting um, you, you know research that one of my colleagues has been doing, and they, it was showing how um, you know, so so remaining active in work is very is 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 important, and it's a fine line between remaining active where you're stimulated and then becoming uh, overworked and burnt out because that's not productive. Um, so it's you know when we we always talk about work life balance, so that's that's very critical to remember. Um, one one of the things that we we there's actually some research to show that particularly in women, um, those who, you know, leave their jobs and careers in midlife um, tend to develop other psychological, you know, mental health related issues, as well as, um, you know, this risk with being, I mean, again, very few studies that are kind of like looking into this, but there's an impact of that uh, mm -hmm. on their brain health. Uh, so I, I think it's it's really, really important to understand that um, remaining engaged in your work is important so long as it doesn't start to wear you out and overwhelm you. Um, okay. Um, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? I think we've already covered this, but if you'd like to just answer that again. So, um, so I think uh, as dementia is a broader term and Alzheimer's is one of the, the most common types of dementia, which is characterized by um, for, for loss of memory. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, I think uh, uh, today uh, we we really focused about you know on on what dementia is and what are the risk factors, and uh, really about early detection and and diagnosis and you know how you can prevent or do certain things to uh, help ward off or reduce the risk factors, so as to say. Um, uh, there are a lot of questions about care and communication strategies and then, you know, what should you do once dementia has been diagnosed? So uh, we do plan to do another webinar. I don't know if Navya has a slide to put up on that, but we do plan to uh, do a webinar on advanced care planning once uh, somebody has been diagnosed with dementia. That's a topic which we'd like to cover maybe in the next month or so. <clears throat> Just stay tuned in and we'll we'll keep you posted. Um, and yeah, so, uh, yes, so. Uh, so thank you, Jayashree, for uh, your, um, your insights and, you know, your, um, your, your guidance on this topic. And, uh, uh, we really hope that you know all those people who are here in this uh, session will go and talk about this with, with their kids, with their friends and family, and and at least uh, uh, do their role in terms of uh, educating maybe at least four more people, each one of you, and then you know uh, that will be the start mm -hmm. of building an inclusive society. And uh, do try out our. Um, of the self-assessment, this link is directly uh, there. And um, uh, so far, all the results which we have seen have been quite in line with the uh, detailed psychological evaluation. So um, uh, if you have the time, you can try it out for yourself and two parents or two friends or two siblings, whatever you would like to do. Uh, Please do share your feedback. Um, and Navya has just shared the, the link here. Um, and uh, thank you for joining everyone and wish you all a good evening. Thank you, Jayashree. Thanks a lot and thanks for joining. Thanks, Navya. Thank you. Yeah. All right.